und er wird ihre Konferenz auch eigentlich äh, geben. Today we have the last session of the conference from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. Central European time. And two main subjects will be dealt with in, in this session with the title of Koran and Hadith Studies and Jurisprudence and Law Studies. In the first part of the session, Professor Dr. Fahad Shafti gives a speech on the Koran by Koran interpretation approach. And uh, Dr. Shefti has received his bachelor and master degree in industrial engineering from the University of Science and Technology and the University of Tarbiyat Mudaris in Iran, respectively. He holds a PhD in management science from the University of Strathclyde. And Dr. Farah Shefti has a second PhD in the theology from the University of Edinburgh. Dr. Shefti, we are going to. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, you want me to share the screen and please do let me know if I manage to do it rightly. Um, thank you. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Talibi has her, his video. Oh, okay. We can see it now. Can you see the screen? Yeah. 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 We can see it now. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for uh, this opportunity, and it's great to be with you. Uh, <clears throat> the Quran by Quran interpretation approach: a comparative study of Taba Tabari and Islahi's method. Uh, I was thinking, well, what what topic to talk about for this session? Um, given that I'm interested in, in Quranic studies. And uh, I, th I thought because of variety of people who may, may listen to this or may listen to this later, maybe I can do a comparative study from, uh, by, uh, for two scholars, uh, one from the Shi'i background and one from the Sunni uh, and the Sunni al Jama'a background. Uh, but two scholars that both of them uh, are actually trying to adopt the same approach that is Quran by Quran. So in this way, I thought maybe there can be something new for anybody who is listening to this. Uh, so I'm going to introduce these two to you very quickly. Uh, I'm going to do a comparison of their work on the basis of three uh, commonly known difficult verses of the Quran. Uh, I'm going to reach some concluding remarks in the form of schematic illustration of the two methods. I'm going to propose some further research. Uh, so I go through these one by one. So to start with, this is Amin Ahsan Islahi, 1904 to 1997. Uh, he was born in India and after partition, he moved to uh, the newly made Pakistan. Um, he was first involved in some political activities with, uh, with Ma'adudi, but very soon uh, decided to leave all politics out and just concentrate on his uh, studies and on the Quran. He is considered as uh, one of the uh, most significant uh, interpreters of the Quran in, 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 in among the Muslim scholarship in Pakistan and India. Uh, and already there are schools called Islahi school that you can find in both India and Pakistan. Uh, he had one single main significant teacher who is Hamiduddin Farahi, again from India, uh, 1863 to 1930. And Hamiduddin Farahi was um, a, an expert in language, in particular Arabic. Uh, he himself was interpreter of the Quran, um, um, and basically Islah, he spent something like 20, 30 years uh, with Hamid din Farahi in the traditional way of tutelage that you, uh, used to be um, uh, the method of studying under scholars at the time in the place. And he studied Quran um, uh, under the tutelage of Hamid din Farahi. Um, if I want to single out one main thing about the method of Hamid al-Din Farahi, I would say the emphasis on language, but 
even more important than that, uh, what he considers to be coherence in the Quran, Nazm Quran. We then have Muhammad Hussein Taba Tabai, which I think many of you know him, of course, uh, 1903 to 1981. Uh, he, he was a great professor of the Quran uh, in, among the uh, Shia scholarship. Uh, he was interested and his approach was interpreting the Quran by the Quran. Uh, he was philosopher. Uh, he, he, he was, he was faqih, although his, his, his philosophy and his work on the Quran was more significant. Uh, he was a student of many teachers and he had many students himself as well. Uh, Ali Qazi Taba Tabai, uh, is one of his main uh, teachers and the one that he himself says that he learned a lot from him in terms of how to understand uh, the Quran. Uh, people who know this, uh, of course, do appreciate, do know that uh, the family names are Taba Tabai for both of them, but that doesn't mean that they are related. Taba Tabai here, I think, simply refers to the fact that both of them were Sayyid from father and mother. Uh, it is very interesting that these two scholars lived, as you can see, exactly at the same time. Um, in fact, I think they even look very much the same uh, in, in face. And both of them were very humble. Both of them were experts in the language of Arabic. Both of them wrote uh, tafsir exegesis of the Quran. Both of them used Quran by Quran interpretation. But unfortunately, they never met, obviously. There wasn't email or Facebook or things like that at the time. Uh, let us look at the um, books of the, the main book of Tafsir, the books of Tafsir of, of these two great scholars. So this is Tadabbur Quran. It is in nine volumes. It's around 5,008 pages. I don't, I don't that, that doesn't mean that much of scientific meaning it depends on the size of the page but ju just to get get a sense of it it was completed within 35 years it is originally in urdu it is only partially translated into english uh, this is uh, al mizan fi tafsir al quran uh, the original uh, volumes were 20 volumes this is around 8000 pages this is much more in detail when you compare it to Tadabbur Quran, it was completed within 20 years. Uh, I don't think that means that Islai has done more, or 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 has done, or or it was less than Taba Tabai has done. Uh, one of the reasons that I think Taba Tabai managed to do this uh, faster, of course, beside his own um, um, talent and hard work, was the team of students that also helped him. Uh, Islai did not. Uh, appear to have that sort of team of students helping him. Um, originally in Arabic, a full translation in Persian, partially translated into English, Turkish, and Russian. Uh, it may be, have been translated in some other language partially as well, but these are the main ones that I'm aware of. I don't want to, because this is going to be a case study approach, so I'm not going to uh, go back to the references and bring out the approach that they have adopted based on those references. I want to do this based on case study, meaning looking at some verses. So before that, uh, I just want to give a quote from each one of them so that you can see um, how they see uh, Quran by Quran interpretation. So from Islam, this is, um, this is not my translation, of course. It says, I have relied on the Quran not only in ascertaining coherence of verses and interpretation of meaning, but in resolving the difficulties. This is not because of the lack of lexical or philological evidence, but because, the, but because the Quran is the most reliable authority on its message and meaning. Tabat Havai says, and that is my translation, uh, the Quran says, and we sent this book to you, that is explanation for everything. It is not possible that the Quran would be explanation for everything and not explanation for itself. How can the Quran be guidance for
for all that people need for for all uh, for all that people need how can the quran be guidance for all that people need but do not fulfill people's need to understand it so basically both of them as you see are saying the same thing that is quran explains itself and we are trying to derive and get this explanation both of them however um make it clear in their introduction now, that doesn't mean that we just sit down and, and just concentrate on the Quran. Of course, we consult other tafasir, other works of exegesis. Of course, we look at the narrations and ahadis. However, our main point of emphasis is to understand things from the Quran, and those will be secondary tools for us. Both of them have said that in a way, and both of them have shown that that is the way that they have tried to do it. So, a brief on this comparative study, how have I done it? So, I chose three verses that are known as difficult verses, Al-Ayat al I considered the author's own explanation of their method in the introduction of their books. Of course, you can imagine that these are not the only verses of the, of the Quran for which I have looked at the interpretation of these scholars i have been student of both of them on a regular basis indirect student of course studying their books so i also rely on my own study of the two methods but i have tried to bring out the key elements of their method using these three case studies and based on that i have formulated an overall view from this for easy comparison so you will see that overall view at the end so starting there are three case studies and i try to go through them one by one uh, what i would like to ask you is that uh, do not worry if you were not sure about some of the details when i say for instance that tabatabai looked at that verse and made such and such conclusion obviously when you don't see that verse when you haven't read the the, the analysis the, the reasoning of tabatabai in itself it will be difficult for you to fully understand okay how that was but that is not the point. We are, uh, re please remember that in looking at these case studies, we are not trying to understand how this case study in detail was. We are trying to understand the method. So uh, please do consider, um, please do consider the overall method that I'm trying to bring out from these case studies. So case study one, Nisa 159. And there is not one of the followers of the book, but most certainly believes in him before his death, and on the day of resurrection he shall be a witness against them. Question. Who believes in who by whose death? So you can see in the tafasi of the Mufassirin, there's a huge debate about this. Number one, to start with, when it says Ahl al-Kitab, does that mean all Ahl al-Kitab, all people of the book? Then when it says La yu'minan nabihi, they will believe in him, believe in who? And then when it says Qabla mawtihi, before his death, before whose death? Of course, this verse is within the context of story of Jesus. So the verses before talk about story of Jesus uh, the, uh, the point that Quran makes that Jesus was not put on the cross he was not he did not die on the cross and then this comes and these questions arise so let's look at how Tabatabai approached this and then we'll look at how um, Islahi approached it so to make it easy uh, because I know it can be confusing in particular when you look at this online uh, and you may lose uh, lose focus easily. Uh, I have put Tabatabai in green in every slide and I have put his picture there as well. And you will see that I have put Islahi in blue and his picture on the other side so that you can easily on, uh, notice that, okay, this is Tabatabai, all right, that is Islahi. So Tabatabai, what does he do? He first explains the literal meaning of the keywords. So he brings out the words and he talks about the Arabic uh, uh, aspects of it and the meaning of it and goes back to some of the books of Logat and talks about them. 
uh, he points uh, he points out what the disagreement is. Now, Tabat Tabai does not emphasize much about any disagreement on Ahl al-Kitab itself, but he emphasizes on La Yu'minan Nabihi and Qabla Mawtihi. So he does say that, yeah, the disagreement is believing who and before whose death. That is the question. He then brings out the main views and briefly comment on them as well. So he says that one of the main views is that it refers to people of the book before their own death. Uh, he then comments on this, that uh, if it refers to Jesus, then that brings unnecessary specification or taxis to people of the book, because one may argue that not all people of the book witnessed Jesus. He says, Another interpretation is that it refers to people of the book before Jesus' death. So it will be people of the book at the time of return of Jesus on that basis. So Qabla uh, Mautihi is Ha here. In one view, it will be pe people of the book themselves, death of the, uh, the people of the book themselves dying before their death, they will believe in Jesus. The other one is that before Jesus' death, they believe in him. Then Tabal Tabai provides his own view. Uh, and he kind of supports the second view. He says the second view is correct, but he then also says, that, however, it includes all people of the book, all people of the book, whether they have witnessed Jesus or not. And he explains uh, how this can be possible. Uh, he brings reasoning. In reasoning, he talks about uh, Siak. Now, if you look at the uh, Al Mizan by Taba Taba, you, you will find that there's lots of mentioning Siyar and Siyar and Siyar in every, almost every few verse. Taba Taba talks about Siyar, the Siyar of the verse, the Siyar. Um, I put the word context for it because I found that in many places they relate, they, they, they interpret, translate Siyar as context, but I think it's actually more than context. It's context, it is also link and relationship between every word. But I just put context here. So he says that my view that it refers to Jesus is due to the context of the verse. It's due to the verses that comes before uh, uh, reference to the verse in Ma'eda. He makes reference to the verse in Ma'eda to argue that in his time of presence on the face of earth, Jesus admits his witness to all people of the book. So it brings that as a reason as well. As I said, don't worry. If you do not fully understand this reasoning, I want you to please concentrate on the overall method, which I'm going to summarize later. He then again goes back and brings possible arguments against his views and then start responding to them. So for instance, he says, yes, there are verses that show that Jews will not believe in Jesus. However, I, meaning Taba Tabai, said that based on this verse, all of them will believe in Jesus. He then explains that. He, and he does say that the belief here does not mean that belief that uh, that that uh, uh, Quran, that normally Quran is talking about. Uh, and, and also he, he explains that it, it is not necessary uh, that that uh, that interpretation can be taken from other verses of the Quran. He brings out verses that may suggest that there are Jews after the final death of Jesus on his return, because he does believe in return of Jesus. Uh, and then he says that those verses can be interpreted differently. Uh, he makes some brief criticism of some rare views, and then he goes to discussion of narrations. In, after every group of verses that Tabo Taboy talks about, he goes on to uh, bring out some narrations. So he, he brings these narrations for you most normally it's from both Shia and Sunni sources. And then the way that he uh, approaches these narrations is that he tries to show that what he understood from the Quran by Quran approach is in line with one or some group of these narrations. And for the other ones, he either justifies them or he says these are not relevant or it says the Hadith is not reliable or he talks about, he says that this hadith is about a very specific mistah, a very specific example or ap application of that verse and not all the meaning of that verse. 
So that is the way that Tabat Tabari looks at this verse. Let us then look at the way that Islahi looks at it. So imagine, uh, consider please, that both scholars say that they are using Quran by Quran approach. So this is Islahi. Islahi considers the main subject of ch chapter four, Surat an Nisa, <clears throat> to be completed by verse 128. You can check that later, what verse 128 is. He considers <clears throat> the rest to be answering questions by Muslims, hypocrites, and people of the book, Jews specifically. Um, he then says that question from people of the book starts from verse 153, where they ask the prophet to send them a book descending from heaven. So in verse 153 in Surat in Isa is the verse in which it, it says that people of the book are saying to the prophet, why don't you just have a book dropped from heaven to you? What is this revelation, gradual revelation? Why you cannot have just one book coming to you? Because Jews in particular, because of uh, the, 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 the understanding that they had from the way that Torah, or at least the Ten Commandments, were revealed. Uh, Islaiden considers verses 154 to 158 to be criticizing Jews, criticizing them in terms of the way that they dealt with Jesus, etc. He considers verse 159 to go back to 153 that is on the subject of the Quran. So he therefore concludes that the verse is actually saying that all people of the book at the time of the prophet will become convinced about the Quran before his death, before, before the uh, death of the prophet, okay? All the people of the book at the time of the prophet will become convinced about the Quran before prophet's death. So as you can see, he comes up with a totally different understanding from the way that Taba Tabai talks about. Taba Tabai relates this to the verses before and concentrates on Jesus. Amin Hassan Islai relates this to the verses much earlier and therefore argues for Quran rather than Jesus here. Interestingly enough, okay, um, he considers this to be warning in line with the theme of the group of chapters in which Surat and Nisa is located. So it looks at the theme of this group of uh, chapters. Um, interestingly enough, Taba Tabai, of course, he didn't know Islahi, of course, but uh, refers to such interpretation. And he writes my, inter my translation. This interpretation is the same as the one before in terms of being irrational and baseless. This is because before this verse, there is no mention of Muhammad so that the verse could relate to it. And this is irrelevant to the state of this verse. Basically, what, about, what Islai has done is that you don't need to read that. I just want to show you the structure. This is from verse 100 and 153 to 159. Verse 159 is the difficult verse that you are looking at. What Islai says is that, look, this part is just like a footnote. It's just like a bracket. These two verses are actually related to each other. So this is talking about Quran, not Jesus. Case study two. Therefore, keep waiting for the day when the sky shall bring on evident smoke. Uh, that is verse 44 in Surat al duhan So then the question would be, what does evident smoke mean? Uh, so again, Talking about Taba Tabai, uh, again, he explains the literal meaning of the keywords. Uh, he does say that uh, there are disagreements about what this evident smoke is. He says that there are four main interpretations. Some say it was famine that came to Mecca. Some say it refers to end of the world. Some say it refers to capture of Mecca. And some say it refers to what will happen in the day of judgment. He then accepts A and B and rejects C and D. But this is one of the features of Taba Taba's work that I, I will go get back to it later, that he does not necessarily has this um, reservation that I need to definitely come to one 
final definite interpretation. If he finds that, yeah, it can be interpreted in a different way as well, he does not shy saying that, yeah, there are two ways of interpreting it. And he goes on explaining both of them in some, in many uh, places, he does not make, make it clear which one he prefers. He just says, these two are possible. So as you can see, that is one of those cases that he accepts A and B, that, 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 that punishment could be famine or that can be end of the world. And he rejects C and D based on the context. Uh, so he interprets the verse based on the last two views. So the rest of the discussion that Tabat Abayi has here, he is explaining the verses that come after based on each one of these two interpretations. So he says that, look, in the verse after, which is verse 11, where it says people will panic, yeah? Uh, he says it will mean people of Mecca based on option A, it will mean everybody based on option B. In verse 15, where it says that if the punishment is lifted a little, they will get, uh, if in verse 15, where it says, if the punishment is lifted a little, they will get back. He says for A, it means getting back to their ways. For B, it means getting back to the punishment in the hereafter. So that's the way that Tabat Abai works on this, rejects to, accepts to and interprets based on those two. Uh, and then of course he discusses the narrations, same style as before. Let us look at this slide. What Islai does is that he says that the chapter of Dohan, the chapter of Dohan is paired to the chapter of uh, Zohrov. Now, one, one thing that I forgot to say, and let me say it just now. Um, there is a huge difference between the way that Tabatabai and Islahi look at the order of the chapters of the Quran and order of the verses. Tabatabai seems like he does not agree that the order of the chapters uh, were divine. Uh, in fact, I think I, 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 I try to make a very humble statement. He definitely does not agree that the order, order of chapters were divine. He says it was Ijtihad of Sahabi. The companions just came up with this order. He even sometimes, although very rare, but sometimes he even questions the placement of the verses. Uh, so, for instance, when he talks about verse 33, 33, the verse of Rich, um, 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 uh, 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 he, he says that this verse seems to be, in, should be in a different place. And it has been put in this place, perhaps by mistake or some other uh, motives. On the other hand, Islahi considers the order of the chapters of the Quran to be divine. The same Quran, that, the same order that we have it today. He considers that to be divine and definitely considers the, the placement of verses to be divine. And then he comes up with putting these um, chapters of the Quran into seven groups. And for each group, he comes up with a different theme. So it says group one has this theme, group two has that theme. And in each group, he argues that most of the chapters are in pairs, like Baqarah and Ali Imran, they're in pairs. So one touches on the same topic as the other one, but on from a different angle. So here he says that chapter of Dohan is paired to chapter of Zohrov. In Zohrov, the emphasis is on monotheism. In Dohan, it is on warning. He then says verses one to 16 are referring to the exalted nature of the Quran and the punishment for those who arrogantly rejected among the Quraysh. He then considers this evident smoke to be literally, literally a punishment that the Quraysh were warned about. An unusually strong hurricane that is supposed to come to you if you do not uh, accept this message. Uh, he dismisses the option that this is about day of judgment due to the context, rejects the narrations that suggest that. He dismisses the option that is about famine based on context uh, and he questions again the, uh, the narrations and also he talks about it based on linguistic. He, he says that Dukhan and Mubin cannot be in translated or interpreted as famine. He refers to the Arab poetry at the time as well as some other verses of the Quran and says this Dukhan and Mubin, evident smoke, um, is some, was a punishment that was going to be something similar to what 
where people of Ad and Samud came. So he, he took it literally in that way. Right. The third case study. Uh, وَإِن مِنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَى رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًا ثُمَّ نُنَجِّ الَّذِينَ اتَّقَوْ وَنَذَرُ الظَّالِمِينَ فِيهَا جِسِيًا And there is not one of you but shall come to it, meaning hell. Uh, this is an unavoidable decree of your Lord. <coughs> of your Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> then we will save the pious and leave the oppressors in it, fallen on their knees. Question. Do all people enter hell? So again, you will find that for this verse, there are many, many explanations. How that? How does that work? Uh, do all people go to hell and then the good ones come out of it and the others stay in it? How is that going to work? So let's see how Tabatabai Tabai is approaching this. So... Again, he explains the literal meaning of the keywords. He then talks about the main views. So people will stay at the edge of the fire. That is one view. This is based on <clears throat> other instances of use of derivatives of worut entering. And Tabata Boy challenges such conclusion from those verses. So although he explains that, he challenges that and he says, well, you know, some counter arguments can be can be given like this. That wurud here means just coming and stay at the edge of the fire. Uh, he then talks about the other interpretation. That means all people will enter the hell. Of course, the hell is not, for instance, on. The fire is not there yet. And then the pious will be saved. Uh, he's, he then comes up with his own view. He says it means merely presence uh, without entering. He analyzes and interprets a number of the other verses with derivatives of Wurud like this as well. Now, this is very interesting, the, the way that Taba Tabai uh, do this. You see, his own view that says it is merely presence is actually the same as the first view that says they just stay at the edge of the fire. It's all, almost the same thing. Uh, however, when he raises the first view, he brought some counter arguments that, you know, the, the people who come up with this view, they come up with these reasons, and this is a counter argument. He then agrees and accepts this, that same view. However, he brings different arguments. It is very interesting. It is when you read Tabo Tabo's Mizan, you feel that he's not just caring to tell you his views, he's actually trying to teach you how to analyze the verses of the Torah. Arguments, counter arguments. He says something and you start feeling that, okay, so this is his view. And then later on, you find that he rejects it. He says something that says, this, this cannot be right because of these reasons. And you say, okay, so he does not agree with that. And then later on, he agrees with that based on different reasons. So it, you get this feeling that he's trying to teach you. It's not just, just giving you the interpretation. Um, he then does some further analysis. And this is where it becomes very interesting. He says, what if one says that in that, you know, forget about the meaning of the word, etc. What if one says that entering is for all because of the nature of the human being? He rejects this on the basis of the part of the verse that says this is an unavoidable decree of your Lord. So he says, look, it comes from God. It's not coming from nature of human being. Uh, this is the one that actually I wanted to say interesting. It's this one, number five. Um, he, however, mentions that one can still argue that Warud is, in fact, entering if one considers saving the pious. I'm sure I didn't get the word right, but saving the pious and uh, leaving the oppressors to be literally related. This is, how, this is what is interesting. He talks about all different views. He analyzes them. He rejects some of them. He accepts some of them. He then comes up with his own view. He gives you the reasoning. And that's the point that you think that, okay, that's us. Let's move on. 
And then suddenly he drops this for you. That however, having said all of that, if somebody argues like this, then there is a possibility that a different view may be entertained and accepted. And this is what I mean that it is as if Tabo Tabo is trying to teach you uh, rather than just give you the explanation. Um, and of course, then discussion of narrations come. Let us look at Islahi. Islahi actually takes this very easy. He says, uh, of you, here goes back to the verse before that were about infidels. It has nothing to do with, with other than infidels. He says that the change of addressing from third person to second person is a style of classical Arabic to show strength and severity. Most interpreters did not see this point due to not considering this oration related technique in the classic in the classic Arabic. So basically it says there's not there's nothing to uh, discuss here. There's nothing to worry about. Menkum among you is actually goes back to Kufar. It has nothing to do uh, with, with others. And the rest of the verse that is some manonaji, some manonaji, then we are going to save others. That does not mean that they were in the hellfire. Um, I, 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 I have something like five, seven minutes, and I only have another two slides to go. I happen to see one of the comments that came up, if I manage to saw it quickly. Uh, let, um, at this point, when I talked about oration, I think it's good for me to quickly address that comment as well. When I was showing you this one, uh, yep, this one, I think a comment came that how does he justify this jump from that verse to this verse? How can he eliminate those few in, in interpretation? This is in fact one of the arguments that Islahi has, and uh, mind you, uh, many other Mufassirs agree with that. Taba Tabai himself also agrees with that. That it is it is one of the one of the features of the style of the Quran, which is very similar to the style of oration, that you jump from one topic to that 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 you're talking about one topic, then you leave it for a while and talk about something different that can be a side topic or a secondary topic. Then you come back to the main argument. So this is nothing uh, strange, and even Tabo Tabai has instances like that. Okay, so these were the three case studies that I talked about. Let me now try to summarize that. As I said, I tried to summarize these two approaches in a, with the use of some schematic models. So let's see how it, what I came up with. So Islahi, because he has this assumption that the chapters of the Quran are on the divine order and yeah, Makki and Madani are next to each other, but that there's a reason for that. And then comes with pairs of chapters and all that. So he comes up with theme of the Quran, general theme of the Quran. And he says that the general theme of the Quran is enzar, warning. He then comes up with what is the theme of each group of those seven groups of the Quran. So he talks about these groups one by one. Uh, what is the theme of them? He then talks about theme of the group of verses in which the verse is located. Uh, he then looks at similar related verses and from there he arrives at final conclusion though starting that at the start um, there's a reason that i wrote though start uh, though stating that at the start uh, i will explain that uh, in the next slide so islahi's approach is just like this from 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 what he considers to be the whole quran to then one chapter of the, one group of the chapters of the Quran, and then one chapter of the Quran, then one group of verses in the Quran, and then that verse. What Taba Tabai does is that he discusses different possibilities and proposing an, uh, and propo uh, then propose an interpretation. Islam does not discuss different possibilities. Uh, if, if one possibility, if one interpretation that he disagrees with is very famous, he just mentions it and says why it is wrong, and then he goes on to explain himself. Tabat Tabai discusses the main interpretation, then comes up with his own interpretation. Bringing other verses and rational arguments for and against the proposed interpretation. As I tried to, as I tried to show you in my case studies, he often goes like a circle, 
to 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 do that in different levels, uh, in, in different um, levels. So he brings an he brings some verses, makes an argument about it, gives you some temporary conclusion. He then questions that conclusion, goes back to the verse, interprets in a different way, comes up with a yet a different uh, interpretation, and just goes on and on until he gets to the final conclusion that he 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 believes in. So often he arrives at final conclusion at the end, most cases. In some cases, as you saw, arrives at final conclusion with a hint that another interpretation may be possible. And at some points, he proposed more than one possible interpretation, as I showed you for that verse. I was thinking, if I want to summarize these two approaches by one word, what word would I choose? I would say for Islahi, it is, I would say it is holistic approach. For Taba Tabai, I would say it is analytic approach. One thing I want to make it very clear, that does not mean that I think that Islahi did not do analysis in his tafsir or that Taba Tabai did not look at the whole Quran in his tafsir. No, of course Islahi also had analysis. And of course Taba Tabai also looked at the whole. However, when you compare their tafsir together, like what I tried to do with those three case studies, that's what remains outstanding for you. Holistic for Islahi, analytic for Tabal Tabal. I have three minutes and I'm going to sum it up. Summary of the comparison. So Islahi, holistic approach, holistic approach, Tabal Tabal, analytic approach. Islahi, mostly vertical, which is looking at structure. Taba Tabai, mostly horizontal, which is cross-referencing. Again, on emphasis, that doesn't mean that Taba Tabai does not look at the whole, but that's what comes outstanding. Islai emphasizes on the general theme of the Quran. Taba Tabai emphasizes on the link between the Quranic concepts. Islai tells you what the conclusion is, and that is what I wanted to say that I said he brings the conclusion at the start. If you are just interested to know what Islai has to say, if you are, for instance, a devoted student of Islai, a fan of his interpretation, then you can just read the first few lines after each verse and tells you what the, what the interpretation is. Tabai Tabai does not tell you the conclusion at the start. He takes you through his journey and he argues for the conclusion. And as I said, sometimes the conclusion is not definite. Sometimes he comes up with different understandings. Islai makes conclusion Definite. Taba Tabai often keeps the conclusion open to challenge, either explicitly saying that one may say something like this and, and leave it there, or come up with more than one conclusion, or even at the time where he is fixing on one conclusion, he has provided you with so many analyses that as if he's opening your mind to question any of those and to come up with something different. Islai invests on the current order of the Quran, but you see less emphasis on the current order of the Quran by Taba Tabai. Uh, if we try to seek a possible synergic effect, and that is where I said that we can talk about future research, uh, just imagine that if we can, inspired by the work that Islai has done, if we can for, uh, formulate a detailed structure and storyline for the Quran, even if we do not consider the order of the chapters to be divine, still if we can come up with formulating a detailed structure of and storyline for the Quran, so that holistic approach, and then inspired by Taba Tabai, if we can come up with a systematic analysis of the relevant verses and concepts in the Quran, what we will end up with will be a stronger holistic analytic approach to interpretation of the Quran. I put the word stronger there because I'm very much aware that there are already many scholars that are looking at both of them together. Uh, I'm not saying that this will give us something new. I'm saying that learning from both scholars can bring us to a more stronger holistic analytic approach to interpretation of the Quran. And that is my 45 minutes. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shakti, for this um, interesting comparative study. Um, now we have uh, 15 minutes for uh, a Q&A. Please raise your hand or um, 
uh, write your questions in the comment comment section. Uh, we have two comments. Um, Firat is asking if you can send the presentation per mail or per Skype um, to us all later on. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, I will follow what the uh, protocol of the conference is. If, if they uh, want, like to have the uh, presentations, of course, I will, I will provide that. No problem. Okay, inshallah. Uh, Hussein is asking, why didn't the late Tabatabai consider the narrations as a possible alternative? The whole, I, if you read the introduction of Tabatabai in Mizan, uh, the whole argument that he makes is that even when you look at the narrations, you find that even, even the narrators, like the Imams of Shia, even they are saying that the best way of understanding the Quran is from the Quran itself. Uh, he says, as I quoted from him, that how is it possible that Quran says an explanation for everything, uh, but yet he does not explain itself. He then says that I have shown you that in order to understand the Quran, you can use the Quran. You can use Quran uh, to, to explain itself. But as I said, that does not mean that he totally ignores narrations. He doesn't do that. You may say that about Islahi. Islahi seems not bothering that much about narrations. Very rarely he refers to any narration in his book. But Tabah Tabai actually has a section on narrations. After each group of verses, he brings all ahadis for you. And you see, the thing is that practically he show you that maybe one reliable way of understanding which narration is better and more reliable is to look what, what is it that the Quran itself supports. Because you see, I'm, I'm talking as if I'm, I'm, I'm following Taba Taba'i's approach. Um, if you rely on narrations themselves, the first point of uh, discussion is which narration is more reliable. So that's the first thing that you need to deal with because there are so many of them and often they come with different meanings, um, uh, uh, disagreements in interpretation. So that's the first thing that you need to, kind of to do something about. And that's the most difficult part because it all depends what are your criteria, the traditional criteria of looking at hadith or more modern criteria of looking at hadith, what is the criteria? Uh, and, and also for some of the verses, we find that Although there may be hadith, but it seems like the hadith is just talking about one example of the meaning of that verse rather than the whole meaning of the verse. What Taba Tabai does is that he uses the Quran to show that this conclusion can come up from the Quran. He then compares it with hadith and then he chooses the hadith that says the same thing. And in, in a way, it is like he's matching his interpretation with one of those ahadiths. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, another question from Farhad Qudusi. Please unmute. Uh, hello, you hear me? Just to check. Yes, Dr. Qudusi, how are you? Salam alaikum, Dr. Shafi. I enjoyed your talk very much. I learned a lot. So, uh, what I want to add uh, is maybe not to the main or have question to me idea of the talk or the conclusions, but you mentioned some differences about Tabatabai and Amin Ahsan Islahi regarding the order of the surahs where divine or judgment of the Sahabas. Uh, what, what about going in the middle way? Because, you know, the Western scholarship for a long time, they were saying the surahs order, their order of, according to the length, which I think now they are kind of backtracking. I mean, because it's not exactly order into the length. And then by the works of Neil Robinson, even I mean, that's in the slide. Or maybe other people shows other factors are there. Maybe huruf al muqatta or there's some surahs we have some huruf al muqatta You want to put them side by side. So why they don't say that the ordering maybe the middle way was the judgment of Sahaba or the first generation Muslim, or they were aware of this idea of pairing and grouping partially. But although from the other side, I said both of the, I mean, Ahsan Islais have some deficiencies, you know, even Mustan Sermir, his, his, his student says, look, we have single surahs which do not pair and the grouping sometimes is artificial, especially Mackie Madani order, because he has changed 
the order of some Madani, uh, uh, some surahs which we know Makkil, for example, like, Allah, had he made the Madani, the order be true. So I'm saying, because uh, what, the last thing, because what, when you say divine, uh, uh, which I agree, but this is those majority of Muslim tradition, both Sunni and Shia, they thinking maybe the collection was after. I'm not saying there haven't been evidence, even John Burton said that. So I'm saying, are you, are you in agreement with this middle compromise that maybe this ordering was the judgment of Sahaba and they were of our of some partially ideas of pairing and grouping? Yeah, I think it is possible. You see, the, uh, thank you, doctor, uh, for this for that. I think it is possible. Uh, I, I agree that uh, maybe a midway might be a way to go. But it is interesting that Islahi, uh, the way that he looks at the current order, he has total trust in it uh, in a way that he even uh, the verse of the Quran that talks about seven of two, depending on how we interpret yeah. Masani, of course. He says, look, sab here refers to the seven yeah. groups of the Quran, and Masani talks about the pairs. So he, he takes it very, very, uh, you know, granted that, that the, the order is the same. And then in terms of Makki and Madani chapters being in the same groups, he actually says that the Madani chapters are application of the Makki chapters in those groups. Uh, Taba Tabai, as you know, uh, does not agree with that. And as I said, sometimes he even questions the position of verses, which for Islahi, that would be like blasphemy to say. But what I'm thinking is that uh, what, one thing that Islahi, I think, did nicely was that he tried to show the storyline of the Quran. Uh, disregard of the order of the chapters, he came up with this concept of uh, itmam al hujja Of course, when I say he came up with this concept, of course, this concept uh, has, uh, has been dealt with by many scholars from the very beginning of the uh, Quran, but he took this concept and he kind of analyzed it and elaborated on it. And he tried to come up with what the storyline of the Quran is. And I feel that storyline sometimes helps a lot in understanding some of the verses. And that storyline, actually, uh, despite the way that Islai has put it, actually that storyline, in my view, is even more uh, clear when we try to look at the chapters of the Quran in a more chronological order, rather than in the order that it is just mm. now. Thank you, doctor. Oh, uh, okay, is it okay just because you brought a very interesting point? Uh, I've had another question if it's time. Do you, don't you see a tension between looking to chronological order or going the way, I mean, as Sanislav, he says, this is the present order. I mean, I want just you clarify and I benefit from, because look, this is the, as you said, many people are interested, especially in Western scholars from Nolteke to Neuwert, all are interested and to go to chronological order. And it has some interesting features with Tassi. I don't deny that. But even when you're making a movie, writing a book like J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter, it doesn't mean you start from chapter one, going to at chapter seven. So uh, book seven, or you, you maybe write chapter five first, then chapter 29, then maybe indexes. And the movies are like that. Then you edit it, and that's the final product. So the final product is not necessarily the order is written. So the traditional Muslim view is that, yes, 23 years was revealed like that, but this is not the final product. And it, it is intended to be like that. And I think that, I, I, again, to, to support this evidence, look, I, I said, if you go to a class that knows somebody in Quran, ask them, you order the surahs, I'm pretty sure hand will be first and Baghara will be the second, a majority. The other ones then if pairing comes. So, so could you explain, don't you see tension? I mean, I, I'm saying we can go read Quran chronologically uh, to know what happened in the early days, how the Muslim community developed, and how was the history of Prophet, life of Prophet Muhammad. But well, if this order is divine, according to Islahi, so shouldn't be, this is the order intended, we, future generations should read it? Uh, I think that's a very good point you made. Uh, yes, uh, it is true that for any book, uh, the order of writing it, or the order of revelation, it, if it is a scripture, may not necessarily be the order that it should be looked at to, to understand it. But it also depends uh, 
what storyline we believe in. You see, it also depends what we believe is the core theme of the Quran. So someone like Islahi, he says the core theme of the Quran is Inzar, which is warning. He then says that this warning is to reach Itmam al hujja which is completion of reasoning. He then says that the whole Quran was revealed in order to bring more and more reasons and warning first to the mushrikeen um, and then to the people of the book in order to reach to them to the stage of completion of reasoning. And at that point, the worldly punishment could come for them if they had not accepted the message of the prophet. And that worldly punishment actually starts um, ex being expressed in Surah at tawbah That's the way that Islai talks about it. And what I'm saying, I mean, if I was a student of Islai, if, if I had seen him, I would have said to him, to him sir, when you put the storyline in this way, then you are actually saying that we need to look at it in a chronological order because that chronological order is telling you that gradual completion of reasoning. I will also add that if, for instance, what Dr. Kodusi says is true, that there can be different storyline, then yes, uh, the order that it is just now can be considered. So it all depends what that storyline is. I see some other hands are up. Uh, I don't know if we have time for more questions. Do we? Uh, we have for one more question. Um, Hussein Azarnio, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you, Mr. Shafti, for your presentation and responding to my question. Uh, it is a very interesting discussion to see how to use the uh, narrations under the verses to interpret uh, Holy Quran. But my questions. But my question was about uh, the narrations under the verse uh, I didn't understand why the late Abba Tawai, um, didn't accept the narrations under this uh, under uh, this uh, verse specifically. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you for for your response. No problem. Uh, Hossein, have you have you read that part in Tabatabai's book yourself? Uh, no, I didn't read that. Uh, but uh, I I understand from your uh, um, presentation that uh, the late didn't accept the narrations. Uh, it is not like he didn't accept the narration. Uh, it, it's more like he talked about different narrations that was there, and he questioned some of them and accepted the other ones. That's what he did. And that's what Tabo Tabai always do at the end of the groups of verses when he talks about narrations. Because he, as you know, um, uh, <clears throat> we have so many narrations for verses for, in, in, for interpreting verses of the Quran that you may say that for the main views that you can find out there, you can always find some supportive narrations. Um, um, it's not like he rejected the narration. He looked at the narrations he picked the ones that was in line with his explanation and he questioned the other ones either in terms of their uh, strength or in terms of whether they are actually talking about the same thing or if they are talking about something different. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's, it will be helpful if you go and read it yourself, you, you will see what I mean uh, uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Muhammad Rizanimati. Thank you for your interesting topic. Did Taba Taba he mentioned about couple surahs like Islahi? And in Islahi's view, couple surahs, how important are they in understanding the Quran? Uh, okay, so the question is uh, according to Islahi, how important are the pairs, chapters of the Quran? Is that what you mean? Um, um, I don't know, Muhammad Rizani Mati wrote um, if they are in, um, important in understanding the Quran, the okay. couple of okay. I, I try to answer based on what I understood from the question. Uh, well, it depends, it depends which approach you follow, you know. If, if you follow the approach of Taba Tabai, Taba Tabai does talk about similarities between some chapters of the Quran. I mean, you can definitely see similarity, let's say, between what Zohar and Inshirah. 
to the extent that some people even consider them to be the same chapter, you definitely can see similarity between Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Ali Imran. In fact, in my in, in my in my in my Telegram channel, I, I showed the similarities between the two, Baqarah and Ali Imran, um, according to Islahi. But Taba Tabai does not come up with this um, systematic uh, theory and view that almost all chapters of the Quran, except a few, are in pairs. Islam, on the other hand, if you are following Islam's approach, he, on the other hand, strongly believes in pairs of the chapters. So what you find is that at the start of each chapter, he first talks about these pairs. He first says that, okay, so this chapter is in this group of the uh, Quran. So the theme is like this. He then says that this chapter pairs with that other chapter, and that one is talk, was talking about this, this one is talking about that. He looks at pairs as looking at the same thing from two different angles. Uh, and you find sometimes that when he comes up with a verse, and the verse is saying that, you know, uh, as far as I remember, if I'm not wrong, for instance, in Surat, uh, in, in, in um, Surat Muzammil, where the verse says that we are going to give you a very strong uh, revelation very soon, very strong news or very strong command very soon. He says that the, that strong command was Surat Muddasr, because Muddasr is paired with Muzam. That is what he says. Uh, now, again, as you may agree, Muddasr and Muzam, it is easy to say, yeah, they, they, they seem to be paired because they are very similar. Of course, Ya Ayyuhan Muddasr, Ya Ayyuhan Muzam, and, and of course they are very similar. But uh, when you go on and, and look at other chapters that he argues that they are pairs, sometimes you start thinking that, well, you know, how, how did you come up with the conclusion that these are pairs? Uh, so yes, it is important if you are following that approach, but the basis of it uh, needs much more evidence, in my understanding. Thank you very much, Dr. Shafti. Um, our Q&A is over. Um, thank you for this interesting um, Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Mrs. Karami, here you go. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> that was so interesting. Thank you and so interesting speech. And uh, now we are going to the next.